I'm Maya Pope Chappelle. Um, as he said, I'm a senior news editor at LinkedIn. Um, I've been there about four years, and I'm really excited to be talking to this to this guy right here, uh, Mr. Thank Kevin you. Powell, um, activist, journalist, writer, author of 13 books. Is that right? 13, yeah. All right, 13 books. Very busy. Yeah. Um, and we're going to talk about authenticity and how to use your influence and your platform to bring change to the black community. So. Uh, welcome, welcome, Kevin. Thank you. you. Know, welcome Thank to you the so Bay. Much. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to be here. Good to have you. Can y'all, can folks move over so we can actually see? The lights are so blinding, I can't it even see blinding. out there. I know y'all are comfortable. You know, come close. A little fireside chat. <laughs> I cannot see. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, I want to just go ahead and get things started. Uh, we'll probably be up here, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions. So okay. definitely, you know, our, jot down some questions as we go through, and we'll open it up um, towards the end. But I actually want to start um, by asking a question that we ask a lot of uh, new hires at LinkedIn and people who come and visit, and that is tell me something that's not on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> There's a lot not on my LinkedIn profile. It's I need not. To, it, could, it could stand an update, but you I know, could, we won't I go there. I need to update it. <laughs> you remember when I said I didn't, I, I, I won't even say, I love LinkedIn now. Let me just say okay. that. I, okay. I actually use LinkedIn as much as I use Instagram and everything else. So shout out to LinkedIn. I am a uh, writer, 13 books, like you said, um, producing my wife's uh, soon-to-be off-Broadway production called She, a choreo play, uh, which I'm really proud of. She's been working on for the last couple of years. Uh, it started before the Me Too movement, but it's actually about ending violence against women and girls. It's about healing and empowerment, and it's really exciting where it's at. Um, and I'm moving fast, swiftly into the, um, the film TV world, which is where I was 20 years ago, you know, because wow. of MTV, Vibe Magazine, HBO, where I used to work. Um, my autobiography, the Education of Kevin Powell, is being adapted for the screen. Uh, working with some folks, fingers crossed, on a film that's never been done before, biopic on Frederick Douglass, never been done before. And actually I'm executive producing an independent film right now with a young filmmaker who's really gifted. Um, that's gonna be happening and uh, shooting in April. Hopefully we'll get that film to uh, Sundance. So those are things that are definitely not on my LinkedIn profile, but because of my wife's show, I've fallen in love with producing. I'm really excited yes. about that and getting okay, we're back. we're gonna have to add all of those things. Yeah, I do. <laughs> You'll help me update that. All right, all right. Branding, I'll, I'll branding, 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 <laughs> yeah. But uh, I also wanted to ask you, um, so I host this series on LinkedIn called yeah. How I Got Here, and it profiles successful individuals like yourself who um, you. tell the story of their career journey and how they got to where they are. Um, and there's a few questions that I typically ask guests, and one of those questions is, how did your background or your upbringing influence your career choice or what you decided to do? That's a great question. My mother, my mother, my mother, um, first influencer, teacher, mm -hmm. leader that I ever met. Um, my mom, single mother, and shout out to single mothers out there. Uh, uh, from the time I was three or four years old, she pushed me hard. College, college, college. My mother has an eighth grade education, but wow. brilliant. You know, she migrated from the South up to the North, to New Jersey, where I was born and raised. Pivotal thing happened, eight years old, she took me to the library. You know, and my mother, there was no books in her house, the Bible, she read the newspaper, the local paper, she's always about the news. But the fact that she took me to the library is the reason that I'm a writer. The first books I read were sports books. I'm a massive sports fan to this day. Um, every time I come out here, Did I try to- Did you see that Nike mishap? <laughs> 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 wow, I go to Warriors games when I come out here, I know that, <laughs> that Nike mishap, yeah. But I- We'll um, talk about that later. Yeah, I, um, um, 11, 12 years old, I stumbled into the adult section, and that's when I was like, wow, uh, reading Hemingway, and then and through high school, reading different writers. Who were you reading? No black writers. Oh, I didn't really? know that, no, I did not know that black writers existed. I was reading Shakespeare, I fell in love with Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, I wanted to be a fiction writer, I actually wanted to be a novelist, but when I got to college, to Rutgers, and shout out to Rutgers University, I know I just ran to one of my old classmates out there, mm -hmm. uh, Sister Eason, hey. <laughs> I. Um, wrote for the school paper there. And, and so my mother, library, college solidified and I discovered black writers in college and I started to see myself. And I, I actually wanted to be in media and um, you know wanted to be a news reporter. That was my first passion was covering the news, covering stories in our communities. Uh, I would say the third big break actually came because of the Bay Area 
Danielle Smith, who used to be an editor at the East Bay Guardian back in the day, who I ended up working with at Vibe Magazine. Shout out to her. Shout Oakland. out to Danielle Smith, who's from this area. She was my first music editor. I was actually asked, uh, did I write about music? Uh, I lied and said, yes, I write about music. And that's how I got the first assignment. Don't lie, y'all. <laughs> Especially in these times, we got a lot of lying going on, as y'all know. Uh, my gosh, well, I'm sure we'll talk about it. I mean, as long as you can back it up, right? Yeah, but I, I wrote a piece and Two years later, Quincy Jones started Vibe magazine, and I was blessed to have an opportunity to write for Vibe, and that's how it just kind of took off from there. So. And would you say that was kind of the, the first pivotal moment for you? Is that kind of what you, set you on the path that, that you're on now? The Vibe magazine? Yeah. I would, you know, honestly, that's a great question. No, I would say the years before Vibe, because mm -hmm. it wasn't like now where you have social media and, and there's so many online publications where you can just put stories out there quickly. I literally grinded for four or five years writing for, for small black newspapers, writing for small presses like East Bay Guardian, LA Weekly. This is pre, you know, scanning thing. We were faxing articles around the country. Uh, I used to write for Thrasher, the skateboard wow. magazine. I mean, I wrote, for, <laughs> I wrote for your mama, I wrote for your daddy, I wrote for anyone who would take me, to be honest with you, because the thing I say to people, you have, you, you have to be passionate about what you do. And I was determined to be a journalist, to be a writer, to be in media, and I just, uh, when, when, when Quincy Jones started Vibe, and it's really, how many of y'all have seen Quincy Jones' documentary on Netflix? I mean, I was in sh awe because it was Quincy yeah. Jones. And all I wanted Crazy. was a little article in Vibe magazine. And they, they asked me at a certain point, was I interested in writing an article on the biggest rap group of the time, which was Tretch Naughty by Nature because of the OPP song, et cetera. They didn't tell me it was going to be the cover story for the very first issue of Vibe. Wow. The very first issue. That's a big break. That's what did it. And then to see Quincy Jones on TV saying, yeah, we got young writers like Kevin Powell writing for us. I mean, Quincy Jones saying my name was mind-blowing. That's That took it to another level, definitely. Wow. Yeah. And then fast forward to today, what is a day in the life of Kevin Powell look like <laughs> right now? It's nuts. I mean, um, I'm up at 5 in the morning. So I'm working on three books simultaneously. My next book is a biography of Tupac Shakur. Uh, I'm working on a young adult book for, for boys, given everything that's been happening in the country around manhood, toxic manhood, as some folks say. Um, and I'm also working on a short essay book, um, speaking like this around the country. Uh, the last couple of weeks, I've been in Vegas. I've been in um, Virginia. I've been in DC, New Orleans. I mean. I probably do 100 speeches a year, corporate wow. speeches, college events like this, which I really support and believe in. I'm really thankful uh, to Sister Johnson, Angela Johnson, the folks who put this together. I think this shout is powerful. Out to you. Shout out Thank you. And because of them, I now know a, a black owned car service here in the Bay Area, Bay Limo. Shout out to Bay Limo. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we got to support black businesses, y'all. You know what I mean? So, um, but no days are the same. You know, um, um, I just. Uh, we, you know, we use the word grind in these times, but I've always, because of my mother, she started picking cotton when she was eight years old. She raised me, do not be lazy. You got to take work seriously. You got to have a work ethic. And so, you know, I just, I get up and I'm constantly thinking about what I can do as an entrepreneur, as an activist. I run my own business. I work with a lot of different people. I'm constantly dealing with things like, what is the day like? We're responding to people needing their tax statements from last year, stuff like that that I work with. I need my money. Yeah, you know <laughs> what I mean? So it just depends. It, no day's the same, which I, I actually like. You know, I, I, It's not easy being an entrepreneur. It's not easy working for yourself. Um, uh, I miss the bi-weekly pay checks at times, the benefits at times, you know, but the flip side is that I can make my schedule uh, and I can travel the country, which has been an incredible experience. You know? Amazing. Yeah. Well, I want to get, uh, you know, to the meat of the conversation, but before we do, I want to kind of level set and would love to hear your definition of authenticity and what that means to you. Wow. So that's a great question. And I, I really love Angela and everyone. The title caught my attention when you sent it to, and you emailed it to us. Authenticity. Um, I have a friend, uh, his name is Ed Garns. He's soon to be Dr. Ed Garns. He's getting his PhD. Uh, his dissertation, y'all, is on black mental health and black people. And he said one of the challenges for us in, this, in, this, in our lifetimes is can we be our authentic selves? And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, can you be your whole self in any setting? Can you be your whole self in corporate America? Can you be your whole self in academia? Can you be your whole self wherever you work? And, you know, appearance-wise, uh, how we speak, can we code switch, as y'all know, we talk about this all the time, 
Uh, can we listen to our kind of music? Can we do our things? I mean, our authentic self, you know, I'm at Rutgers University as a college student and how, you know, our fraternities and sororities are criticized by how we were initiated mm -hmm. as opposed to white fraternities and sororities, questioning our authentic authenticity. Um, I was just telling Maya before we started this that New York City, where I'm based at, I've been living in New York for 29 years now, uh, over half my life, they just literally passed in a law saying that black people have the right to wear their hair any way they want to at work because there have been so many complaints. Which is uh, crazy. Yeah, which is very crazy of wow. black folks being told how they can and cannot wear their hair. Our authentic selves. Mm -hmm. Our authentic selves, you know, can we have our spaces? Can we be in spaces where we don't have to water down who we are? You know, authentic selves. You know, I think about uh, Colin Kaepernick, since we're in the Bay Area, you know, can you peacefully protest something that you think is unjust as a person of color and not be penalized for it? Yeah. You know, and thank God he just got that huge settlement, you know, with the National Football League, which is justified because of what has happened to him in terms of him being banned, banned from football for all intents and purposes. And so I think it's just the ability to be able to speak truth to power while also doing our work. You know, of course we're gonna work hard, of course we're gonna, we, we believe in excellence, we believe in being successful and, and helping our, helping the bottom line of our businesses, our companies, but we also should be able to be able to be the, be the totality of who we are in those spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think authenticity also requires you to maintain or adhere to your own kind of personal values, right? Yeah. So for you, what are those personal values that are most important? My God, especially, <laughs> given it all happening in the media right now, be honest, be mm. honest. Integrity. Be in integrity is so yeah. important. I work, you asked me how my days are. I work with a lot of young people all around the country, and that's the big word that comes up a lot, like, you know, integrity, honesty. Humility, humility, mm. humility. Um, um, and if you don't, aren't humble, you will have life experiences that will certainly humble you. God knows that I have had them many times in my life, but I think it's important to be kind to people. Uh, to be respectful to people, to have compassion for folks, you know, um, um, and, and, you know, help people. You know, what I say, my, our individual success means nothing if we're not actually reaching back and helping other people. You know, I believe in the Harriet Tubman theory. Harriet Tubman could have said, you know what, I'm good. Since it's Black History Month, Harriet Tubman, I'm free. I was able to escape from slavery, but Harriet had the courage and the empathy to go back and, and free and help other black folks become empowered as well. That is part of my value system. You know, okay. I, nothing I do, and you know this, my, we've known each other for a while. It's like, you know, let's help other people, let's support other people. And I want to shout out, where's Mika Scott at out there? Is she out there, Miss Scott? You don't want to shout her out as well, because this is a sister whose son I met what, almost a year and a half, two years ago. Um, you know, she's another example of it always trying to connect the dots in the community. That's what I'm talking about. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Miss Scott. Can we give her a round of applause, please? I just need to say that. That's an example of what I'm talking about. That's important, so. Perfect, and speaking of integrity, I actually want to bring a little pop culture in here, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, how many of us have seen uh, the video of Monique and Steve Harvey arguing on the TV? Most, some of us? All right, so for those who aren't familiar, uh, Monique was on Steve Harvey's show recently, and they were in a heated discussion um, uh, about her just being blackballed from the industry. And Monique's stance was essentially, you know, she's not giving up her integrity no matter what the cost, right? Um, and Steve, on the other hand, had a different take. He since walked back a bit um, in yeah. terms of suggesting that she should put her integrity aside. Um, but I actually want to read a quote uh, from him and get your thoughts on this. Um, and here's what he said, when you tell the truth, you have, to tell, you have to deal with the repercussions of the truth. We black out here. We can't come out here and do it any kind of way we want to. This is the money game. This ain't the black man's game. This ain't the white man's game. We in the money game. What do you think about that? And can we be ourselves out here? Y'all want me to say what I really feel? Yes. <laughs> be my authentic self? Be your authentic self. My authentic Negro self? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Steve Harvey is a sellout, honestly. I'm just gonna say what I feel. I watched that interview and you know, I, I was blessed to be a part of a Netflix documentary that's on right now on the life of Sam Cooke. Anyone seen it? Has anyone seen it yet? The Two Killings of Sam Cooke? It's an incredible documentary. Sam Cooke was already my favorite singer, songwriter, and you know, he would have been Barry Gordy in Motown if he had been killed. Yeah. <sighs> I think what people like Steve Harvey need to understand, what we in the audience need to understand, is that none of us would be in the positions we were in if it wasn't for people like Sam Cooke, 
like Nina Simone, whose birthday is today, y'all. She'd have been 86 years old today. You know, there are many folks who sacrificed in corporate America, in sports, Muhammad Ali, you know, John Carlos and Tommy Smith, 68 Olympics, Nina Simone. When Nina Simone made one song, Mississippi Gone Damn, yeah. she literally got banned across the American South. You know, but think about all the doors that it opened for other people. And I think that, you know, I'm not telling people not to make their money, not to have your careers. Of course you want to do that, but you also have to take a stand at some point. Otherwise, you come across as someone who has no backbone whatsoever, you have no spine whatsoever, and you're thinking about yourself as opposed to the larger community. I'm gonna give you an example. I love Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier. They've been best friends. They're both now 91, 92 years old. They've been friends forever. They made a conscious decision in the late 1950s. Okay, Sidney, we're, and Harry, we're going to do this inside-outside game. Sydney, you're going to do the Hollywood thing. You're going to make all those movies. You're going to get the Academy Award, whatever's going to happen for you. Harry's like, I'm going to support the Civil Rights Movement. But at the same time, Sydney was also supporting the Civil Rights Movement, just in a different way. In other words, they understood community. You know, let's communicate with each other. You know, let's talk privately. The thing that bothered me about the thing with Monique and, and Steve Harvey, with Steve Harvey, is the stuff that he was saying to her, I wish it was a public yeah. conversation. Instead, it became a, a public spectacle. Y'all with me out there? Yeah. A lot you know, of folks in the audience were clapping. A lot of, yeah. Who and don't look like us. Say that again? Who don't look like Who us. Who don't look like us. And, you know... I had a sister friend at Vibe Magazine who said to me years ago something that took me a long time to understand. Her name is Omaranke uh, Edo Reeves. She said, do not be the entertainment for other people. Do not be the entertainment for other people. And I just feel like, brothers and sisters, if we're serious in corporate America and Hollywood, where I'm heading in a couple days after this, some conversations can be public, but some conversations also need to be private. Like, what do we need to do privately to get more black folks into Silicon Valley? What do we need to do to keep this momentum going with black Hollywood? Do y'all feel me out there? Yeah. What do we need to do, LeBron James and D. Wade and Chris Paul, for black athletes out there privately? Not everything needs to be public. And I don't think, you know, I'm not, I got to say this, you know, this whole culture, I love social media. I'm on it religiously. But what has happened, the sensationalism, yeah. the whole got you culture, the whole trying to destroy people culture, I just can't support that. And we as black folks, whether we're poor black folks or middle class, professional, college educated black folks, we can ill afford to go at each other. There's so few of us in these positions. There's so few of us in these positions, you know what I mean? So I think long and hard, and I've had people attack me who are black on social media, and I've had to suck it up and not say anything, because I'm like, I don't want to be a spectacle anymore, because I know what it's like to be a part of a spectacle. And what I'm really more interested in is what Ms. Johnson has created. How do we get to empowerment? Y'all with me out there? You know what I mean? And I believe we get to empowerment. Folks in the back, y'all with us out there? We get to empowerment. Uh, all right. There has to be, as they're drinking their liquor, go on, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Support flow. That's my frat brother's wine. You know what I'm saying? Mark, brother Johnson out there. But love. I can't think about empowerment if I don't actually love myself and I don't love my people and I love black people. Does that make sense, y'all? You know what I mean? So I think more than ever, like, is it worth me getting into some sort of public thing with another black person that's going to pit people against each other? Is classic divide and conquer, mm -hmm. and, and we end up losing. And I mean, Monique has a right. There should be room for Monique to speak her mind. Just like, I mean, if y'all saw the Nina Simone documentary, Nina Simone was speaking her mind. You know what I'm saying? But we can't ostracize people who may have a different way of looking at things. Does that make sense, y'all? Yeah. They're still part of our community. They're still part of the family. Do I agree with everything my mama says? I don't agree with things, about 50% of stuff my mama says, but I'm not going to diss my mama publicly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And speaking of that, like just taking it to the workplace, do you think that, that black people can be their authentic selves in a professional environment in, at work? I think if we want to, I think, I think part of it, since this is Black History Month, let's bring it to uh, our brother Carter G. Woodson, who, uh, as you all know, created Negro History Week in 1926, which became Black History Month in 1976. His most famous book was obviously The Education of Kevin Powell. And he, Kevin Powell, that's my <laughs> Not book. Not you. <laughs> the Miseducation of the Negro. Yes. Freudian slip, like for real. <laughs> I am so sorry. Purchase I, that book. No. <laughs> That's what you wanted to say. It's all good. You Here I am talking about humility. Self. I'm putting Carter G. Woodson's book title in my book. I'm sorry, y'all. The Miseducation of the Negro. Um, I think a lot of us are scared. Hmm. I think a lot of us are scared. You know, um, I see it. You know, um, I see it. I get questions from people, you know, privately. You know, what do I do? How do I navigate this stuff? And what do you say? Stand up. 
It doesn't mean you got to yell and scream. No one's saying that you got to shut down the company, you got to threaten boycotts, anything like that, anything like that extreme. But I think what Carter G. Wilson's saying, don't go create the back door either. You know, you, you, if you're at, a, at this company, you deserve to be at that company, and you need to stand up for some things that are basic. And like, if there's a lack of diversity and inclusion at your company, which means everyone, if, you know, if there's not enough people calling enough black folks to serve positions, you should be raising your voice about that. If there's not a pipeline to historically black colleges and universities or black students at any college and university, you should be raising your voices about that. You know, if you feel that your black group at a corporation uh, should be supported in a different kind of way, you should be raising your voices about that. I think that we can ill afford to be afraid of raising our voices. And I think we also can't afford to become comfortable because I think that makes us inauthentic when we're like, okay, I'm good, you know, and we just kind of settle into this. And I've been dealing with this at a couple of places that I've done consultant work at where it's very clear that certain people have gotten very comfortable with their positions mm -hmm. and they just don't want to rock the boat at all. Yeah. And it's not even radical stuff we're saying. We're just like, hey, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. Not corporate America, academia. I've been at certain colleges where the black administrators are afraid to support the black students at all, which means no, makes no sense because you're not there if it wasn't for the students. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I'm like, what is the point of you being in this position in corporate America, in academia, in politics, whatever it is, if you're not really serious about the empowerment of your community? Are you with me out there? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because this has got to be about building something for the long haul for us as a people. You know, uh, other folks are not apologetic about saying, well, I represent this group, which is my group, or I represent this group, which is my group. And so I'm saying we have to be willing to do the same thing. I don't care what space I'm in, I'm constantly asking, where are the black people? You know, where are the black people? Where are the black people in leadership positions? Why aren't they moving up? I just had this conversation with a, a university official today a white sister who's a great friend of mine, a great ally of mine, but she started saying something that was imposing her value system on the way I saw things. I said, well, no, I don't agree with that because your value system does not include people of color at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? And she had to step back. I said, now, if this was a Me Too moment, you as a woman, as a white sister, you'd be the first one to say, well, what about first, diversity and inclusion? But here I'm a black person talking about diversity and inclusion, and you have nothing to say. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I think that we also have to be willing to have these difficult and uncomfortable conversations with love, with love, but we have to do it. Because what is the point of being in these companies? I mean, sports. We just had All-Star Weekend, NBA All-Star Weekend. Again, I'm a huge sports fan. The National Basketball Association is 80% black males. Michael Jordan is the only one of 32 majority black owners in the NBA. There's something wrong with that. National Football League is also, is bigger than the NBA. Mm -hmm. No majority black owners. The football, National Football League is 80% black players. These are the kind of conversations around diversity and inclusion. The way black folks use Facebook and all the social media out there, where are the black executives at on the higher levels? Those are the conversations that we really have to have the courage to have. Right. And then I feel like a, a lot of black folks, and you mentioned code switching earlier, I feel like a lot of black folks sometimes feel like they need to, to switch it up, whether it's their language, their hair, how they look, whatever. When did you, did you ever care about what people thought about you or how did you move into you know, being comfortable with being your authentic self and being able wow. to speak up. Have you always felt that way or did you well, I mean, transition I'm, into that? I'm uh, generation X, I guess you would call it. And so we're like the first generation, that those of us born in the late 60s into the 70s, to go to integrated schools. And so my life was already code switching from birth practically. Uh, K through third grade, 99% black and Latinx schools. Mm. Fourth grade through 12th grade, majority white school, high schools I went to. Uh, up until 13, lived in an inner city environment, only black and Latinx people. 13 to 18, lived in a majority white neighborhood. Then I went to Rutgers University, uh, overwhelmingly white university. And so by necessity, then in my household, my mom is from South Carolina. She's a proud Geechee from South Carolina, which means that I was also speaking that language. So out of necessity and just the different experiences, I was, I guess, like a lot of us, organically code switching without realizing it. Mm. You know, you're speaking one way in the house, you know what I'm saying? And then you're speaking one way at school, and then you got your friends that you're around. And then this little thing was created, you know, called hip hop that I've been a part of from the very beginning. And so I've always said to people, you know, to black people, black professionals, we have to be multilingual. You know, I mean, if I was in Brooklyn, all right, what up, son? I mean, you know, we just flip it. 
It's no big deal, but it's just the way we talk or the way y'all saying the Bay Area is hella cool, right? You know what I'm saying? And if you're from the Bay, you know what we're talking about, right? I love the way y'all say hella out here. I was like, that's dope, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to Oakland. Word, but Speaking, I, I, think, I just think that language is important. I think that we should master the language and not be apologetic about the ability to speak many languages. It's no different than the fact that I can speak English and you habla espanol, es muy importante. Why can't I speak Spanish too? Y'all feel me? I grew up with Puerto Ricans and Dominicans in New York City and Jersey City, so I also can speak Spanish. And so I just think that it's also part of us not just surviving, but navigating so we can actually win. Speak multiple languages. What's wrong with that? Why be apologetic about it? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you're less authentic. It just means that you understand that you can flip in different spaces. I love that. And speaking of uh, generations, we, we can clap, we can clap. Thank you. Share it on LinkedIn, too. Share these gems. <laughs> Um, speaking of a uh, generation, um, I think of someone like Steve Harvey, who we mentioned, or you said was a sellout. Um, but he has you know had what? a lot of success. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I come back for a second? No, no, you can't clean that up. Well, no, it's not cleaning it up, but I, I, I've said to people, let's stop name calling each other. I just, I just, I just see a lot of problems with Steve Harvey. He, you know, I, I, I think his advice to uh, on relationships are horrific. I think they're patriarchal, sexist, misogynistic. I think that they're biased toward us as men and they're disrespectful to black women, but people are buying the books because people are desperate for love and happy relationships. Mm -hmm. so, and I say to y'all, a more important person to read and buy their books is Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks, Bell Hooks. Her trilogy on black love is much more balanced, you know what I'm saying? And I just think that we've got to be very careful of people just selling us stuff and not questioning the content of things. Does that make sense to you all? Yeah. You know what I mean? And this is where the deeper, the deeper analysis needs to come in around our empowerment. Like, what are we getting out of this? You know, my wife and I talk about this all the time. It's like, you know, we want to have a healthy relationship, but it's as equals. I'm not the head of the household. She's not the head of the household. We're co-heads of the household. We're partners. We're partners. We're partners. And we're not buying into these tired, stereo, these yeah. tired gender roles of here's what the man does and here's what the woman does. It's like, well, what are you good at and what am I good at and how do we bring this together? Does that make sense, y'all? That's real empowerment exactly. to me, you know? Well, speaking of that, well, I was just going to say, you know, Steve Harvey is successful in his own right. But yeah. then I think of people like Ava DuVernay or even like Nipsey Hussle. Like these are younger people who are unapologetically black yeah. and still successful. Do you think that there is a general generational divide in how people think about how you should comport yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I think God for this little, you know, there's hip hop culture and there's hip hop, the industry. I represent the culture. I just want to make that clear. I make a the distinction. And what, what we, when I say the culture, it's an energy, it's a spirit, it's unapologetic, it's about empowerment. You know, you know, when Vibe started back in the 90s, I didn't even think about being a CEO. But then when you see Diddy, you see Jermaine Dupri, you see Queen Latifah, you see all those folks saying, I'm the head of my company, and they're all in their 20s. You feel what I'm saying? It makes you say, oh, we can do this. Just like I see folks who are millennials now doing the same thing. And it's a beautiful thing because I think that, you know, that era, they just want to get in the door, you know, and they don't want to rock the boat. We're like, we don't want to just get in the door. We actually want to own the door. There's a big difference there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We want yeah. to own the house. Say that again. We want to own the house. We want to own the house, not just Damn the door. The door. <laughs> That's not good enough. Damn the door. Yeah. Um, and, and speaking of that, like, uh, just going back for a minute in terms of like sacrifices, has there been a point in your career where you feel like you sacrificed something for your values or something you believed in? Well, Vibe Magazine. Uh, I actually got fired from Vibe Magazine. It's the last job I ever had, too. But part of the reason why I got fired was my bad attitude. I will admit that. You know what I'm saying? I was young and fiery, and I'm still fiery, just older, but you know, in the different. You said kind polished of, earlier when we polished. were talking. I'm a polished Negro now. <laughs> nah, I'm still fiery. I ain't. I'm not never stopping. But um, at the time, and God bless Quincy Jones, but um, Vibe did not have a black editor in chief, and I literally could write an article. The copy editors, the editors were all white sisters and brothers, as if black folks didn't know how to edit anything. It would not, the photographers for the first 12, 13, 14 issues of covers of Vibe Magazine were never black photographers or Latinx photographers. I had a problem with that. And then the interns would only come from Ivy League schools. Shout out to my sisters and brothers who went to Ivy League schools, but what about Howard University? What about San Francisco State? What about the Peralta school system? Y'all feel what I'm saying? You know, my thing is like, when I think about diversity and inclusion, it means everybody, everybody, everybody. And so I started challenging it because I was the so-called star writer, one of the star writers of the magazine. I said, there's something wrong with the fact that my articles will not touch black hands again until it hits a newsstand. You know what I mean? And so I sacrificed, 
I, I got fired and it affected me for a couple of years. I talk about it in that book. There's a whole chapter about that. And I got fired right around the time that a few months before Tupac Shakur got killed. So it was a very devastating period for me. But in retrospect, I know that I was right because eventually people like Emil Wilbekin and Danielle Smith ended up becoming the editor in chief of Vibe, which was the right thing to do. Because how are you going to have a magazine or a publication that was created by the spirit of hip hop, which was created by black American, West Indian, and, and, and Latinx sisters and brothers, people of color, and then you don't have black people running the outlets that's supposed to be representing the culture that people of color created. Does that make any sense at all? That's not empowerment. And so yeah. I sacrificed my own career at the time, but it was worth it because I, I love the fact that we see a lot of folks running these spaces online now. And that's why I shout out, where's Ms. Johnson at, Tyne Johnson at out there? Is she out there? The, there you go. You know what I'm saying? When I meet people like you, she said, how do you know my publication? Because I purposely pay attention and I seek out younger people who are creating spaces online. Because you have the courage to do things that we, couldn't, we didn't think about 25 years ago. That's the honest to God truth. Seriously. And speaking of which, I was going to ask you, in being an entrepreneur, do you think that that's freed you? Yes. Um, tell me about that. And do we, you know, for us, for those of us who are working at these, these corporations, do we, do we need to be freed and be no, entrepreneurs? No, I think you need your biweekly paycheck and benefits. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful thing for y'all who have it. It's not a game. My wife has benefits. I'm like, get them benefits, sister. Keep them benefits. <laughs> And let me be on your benefits. <laughs> but you definitely think it, it makes it easier when, it, when you work for yourself? Well, I've had both experiences. I've worked for Viacom slash MTV. I've worked for Vibe slash Time Warner. So I've worked for two of the biggest multinational corporations in the world. Um, it was amazing. I had access to all kinds of resources. You know, when I was at Vibe, I mean, I could just press a button and all of a sudden all this stuff would just come to me. Here you are. And people were doing my expense reports for me. Working for yourself, you're doing all your expense reports. You're paying for all the bills. You're making sure all the taxes are done. I got an accountant. I got a tax attorney. I got a bookkeeper. But what has shifted for me, I've learned how to be a business person. And I did not take a single business class. I'm embarrassed to say that. In college, that's one of my big regrets. And I tell students all the time, I don't care what your major is, take a business class. Take an economics class. Learn how to learn entrepreneurialism. I think it's really important. I had to learn it by trial and error. I've had great successes. And I've had massive failures um, as a business person over these 22 years. Uh, some of them embarrassingly uh, terrible. Because um, honestly, at times, I simply did not know how to handle money. You know, even with my wife's theater production, when we started it three years ago, it was a $15,000 budget. This is now nearly a million dollar production. But the difference is that I know how to handle this and I know how to bring in people who are able to work with us. And so I, it, it has forced me to exercise muscles that I didn't know existed, if that makes any sense. And I think that everyone, even if you work in a, a full-time space uh, in Silicon Valley or Fortune 500 company, I think it behooves you to start, have your own s small business on the side, because I think it's important to know how to run a business top to bottom, just like I think it's important to own a piece of property, because you, we need to learn real, we need to know real estate, we need to know entrepreneurialism, because I think these are skill sets that we take for granted that we've had in our history as a people. It's not like it wasn't there before. And so I think we need to have that balance. I really am glad I've had both sides of the experience. Thank you, thank you. I just want to do a quick time check. How much time That's do we right have? There. Oh, okay. See, I didn't even see yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm cool. looking at you. Thank All right, you. cool. Well, we got about 15 minutes. I'm just going to ask you just a couple more questions, and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, but for, I think that it's you know, easier sometimes when you are in a position of power, right, or you have influence to, to take these type of stances. But say you're an intern or you're a professional who's just starting out in their career, what advice do you have for them um, to, to be their authentic self, to take stands like that when they're just trying to you know, move up, get, get promoted? What's your advice? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question about interns. I've had interns with my companies for the last 10, 12 years Usually in, the, usually in the summer, and the students come from all over the country. And it's not just black students, it's white students, it's Latinx students, Asian students. You know, um, I try to get as many black students as possible, especially black males. A lot of times black males are the least likely to apply, so I ask, you have to go out and recruit. Because I want to let folks know, hey, brothers, come on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's do this, you know what I mean? And, and, and I'm here for you in a certain kind of way as a black male. I don't treat interns the way some people treat interns. I've had interns come to me and say they, their previous internship, the whole semester, all they did was mop the floor and clean up the office, which I think is insane and disrespectful to a young person. You know, I, when they come to my work, to my business, I'm like, what is it that you actually want to do? What do you want to get out of this? Don't call me boss, number two. We are teammates. 
We are teammates. We are teammates. I make that very clear. And I believe in empowering young people. Like, I want to hear your voice. Because when I, was, I got my first check as a writer, not as an intern, but I, I never even had an internship. I was a, a, a writer when I was 20 years old, when I was still at Rutgers University. And the person who hired me treated me with so much respect. This person was 60 years old. And I'll never forget that. Or even if I can take it to Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones was 59 when he started Five, 58, 59 when he started Five Magazine. Our entire staff, we were all 20-somethings. We were all under 30 years old. Quincy Jones never treated us as anything other than his equals. Y'all with me out there? Yeah. And so I think it's important if you work with younger people to respect and honor younger people and respect their genius, you know, um, and tell them that anything is possible and also challenge younger people on what, they're, what they can improve on. Because what I do always, too, is a needs assessment. Like, what are you strong at and what do you need to work on? And, and, you know, what I say to younger people all the time, no matter how dope they are, it's not good enough to just know what's happening in 2019. You got to know what happened in 1999, 89. You got to be aware of all the history that came before you, you know, especially because I work a lot in entertainment, in the music industry stuff, uh, journalism, media, as you do. And I, I, it, it bothers me when people don't know the history, because when I was coming up as a younger media person, I made it a point and go back and study the people who came before me. I can't take for granted that this just started with me or a couple years ago. I need to honor the elders, the folks who came before me. Are, are y'all with me out there? You know, so, but it's always with love, though, because I'm always like, how can you empower young people? That's what I think about. And speaking of history, um, just one of my last questions. Like, I think of, like, a Paul Lawrence Dunbar, yeah. the face, the, the mask we wear, or W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, the souls of black folk, his concept of double consciousness. These, these concepts are new, but do you think that we're pushing the boundaries on those things today, wow. or wow. Are, we, are we changing? Well, I mean... You know, it's, it's an interesting question. I think because of hip hop, which has permeated everything, it's permeated everything, I think black folks have become more unapologetic than ever before about who we are. You know, I really yeah. believe that. I mean, if you'd have told me 20 years ago, for example, this corporate sport called basketball, people like LeBron James and Kevin Durant and other folks would say, you know what, I'm ready to get traded now. I'm ready to you know, be a free agent after two years. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to this team over here and I want you to join me. I mean, that was unheard of. I mean, just six, seven years ago, I wrote an open letter in Ebony Magazine challenging black athletes for not taking a bigger stand. But here we are, Colin Kaepernick, all the stuff has happened since then. And so I do think that you know, um, um, we are stepping on the, the line. I think a lot of us are taking the mask off. You know, and, and we're very clear that, you know, uh, uh, we deserve to be empowered. Why not? What was the point of the civil rights movement, everything that our ancestors did before this, for us to just be happy to have a job or a career? It's got to be bigger than that. It has to be bigger than that. We have to have the house. Yeah, you have to have the house. <laughs> um, all right, let me, uh, yeah, let me open it up to questions. Okay, I'm going to come over there. Great questions minutes. from you. Please You're raise welcome. your hand if you would like to ask a question. Are you all all right out there? It should be at least 50 hands up. We got Kevin Powell here. Any questions? He's got the serious voice. <laughs> and you got the serious I'm, I'm gonna check. start calling on people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Come on now. Let's, let's get some questions up. Thank you, Sarah. I'm trying to see. Hi, hey, how you doing? Wh what's your name? My name is Sarah Anders. Hey, Miss Sarah. Yeah, um, so my question is, is like, you know, we've all been there. We've all been in those spaces of like, ooh, I should have said something. Ooh, I didn't say something. Ooh. So when you're in that moment, like, what are some words of encouragement or where do you draw inspiration from? Because as an actress, I work on set. Usually if I'm getting paid, it's all white everything. I'm the only black person. Yeah. If I'm not getting paid, I'm volunteering my work for my people because I believe our stories are dope. So in that situation, it's like, where do you draw your inspiration from? Where do you draw kind of your, <clears throat> like, no, this isn't right. Like, what you doing? Why are you darkening her makeup? She, that's not, you know, in certain situations like that, I just feel like we lose our voice and we don't stand up. And sometimes, yes. you know, what, what do you use to be like, ah, we gonna get them? Like, what's your inspiration? Um, Sojourner Truth. Harriet Tubman, I was gonna say. Malcolm X, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, Angela Davis, George Jackson, um, a range of people, sisters and brothers, people, James Baldwin, Audre Lorde, you know, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, it's a range of people who came before us who had to go through a lot of the same stuff. We have a, I just think we have a responsibility to speak up. And again, you know, come with love. I just I wanna keep saying that. It took me a long time to even understand that concept. When I was younger, emotionally, 
uh, intellectually, I would always say, well, why is Jimmy Ball, James Baldwin talking about love so much? Why is uh, Dr. King talking about love so much? But I realized that that's important. I mean, love is the most revolutionary thing we can practice. And clearly, if love was practiced all over the place, we wouldn't have the level of hate that we have in this, in this country, in this world right now. You know, and I think it, whether it's racism or sexism or homophobia or transphobia or anti-Semitism Semitism or Islamophobia or ableism, any form of, of oppression or discrimination of hate, you know, we become, as Audre Lorde said, complicit in it if we don't say something. We become complicit. You know, um, I, I think about the things that my wife has had to deal with as a black woman. You know, she's had to challenge the racism and sexism as an educator, as an artist. My mother had to deal with racism, sexism, and classism because she grew up as a poor black woman. But she was always, even when I was a child, I remember her using her voice, using her voice, using her voice. That's where she got it from. And my mother, I mean, think about how vulnerable people like my mother was, you know, eighth grade education, poverty, a single mother. You know, we could have gotten evicted from apartments. I could have been kicked out of a lot of schools, but she felt like I got to stand up for what's right, you know, and she was right every single time. And I just think that we do ourselves a disservice and we disempower ourselves. And this gathering is about empowerment. We disempower ourselves when we do not use our voices, if we feel that something is wrong. And I just think also, I know it's exhausting, and I think this is important to say, Maya and, and Angela and everyone out there, you know, the unfortunate thing is if you're uh, any person who's been marginalized, if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, if you're a queer sister or brother, a queer person, if you're a poor person, what, or if you're a disabled person, whatever you, if you've been dis marginalized any part of your life, you know, make sure you also are practicing self-care, 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 self-care as much as possible because the, pro the part of the reality is that we constantly are in teaching mode and, and pushing people mode because if we don't do it, a lot of things will not change. You know, we have no, res we really have no choice because once you become woke, as y'all know, you have to speak up, you know, but I also make sure, like this morning, I've exercised. Tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., I'm at yoga. I'm also meditating and, pr meditating and praying every day. You know, I, I think it's important I go to therapy, you know? Probably one of the most important things any professional can do is go to therapy in some form. It doesn't have to be a, phys a literal counselor or therapist, but is there, are there safe spaces for you that you can go to where you can just get away from all of this madness out there? Are y'all with me out there? Yeah. This is really critical because the level of alcoholism and drug abuse and the level of suicides among black professionals, I was one of them. The chapter after I got fired from Vibe magazine is actually called Suicide. Massive depression. Massive depression for a few years. Y'all feel what I'm saying? And these are conversations that we gotta be willing to have, you know, because what you're talking about, constantly having to challenge, you know, people's ignorance, it will wear you down, you know, especially if you're the only, you feel like you're the only person around. And so I also believe that we gotta create communities of people around us. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Who's your circle? So you're not out here by yourself. Does that make sense? So I'm a vegan. I belong to a vegan community. I'm a yogi. I'm in the yoga community. You know, I'm in a progressive hip hop community. I'm in a progressive media community. You know, I'm like, who are my people where I know that they know that I'm not crazy. I know they're not crazy. We can just vent freely and get this stuff off our chest. Does that make sense, y'all? That's what I wish I could say to my 20 something year old Kevin Powell back in the 90s. Self-care, self-care, self-care. The career is great, but by 30, I was burnt out because of it because I wasn't practicing any self-care, which is a form of self of empowerment. Wow. I love when black folks hear something inspirational. We go, mm. <laughs> Two snaps, mm. two snaps. <laughs> you, I mean, it's real. Because you talking today, brother. Thank we you. got one more question for you. Hi, Marcy Jones with Urban Connoisseurs, and I hey. am an entrepreneur. I love that name, uh, Urban Connoisseurs. Thank you. That's dope. All about the black winemakers. Uh, the, so this, you, this is the, that's this me. Is the, that's me. That's all. That's all. This wine this weekend is all. I need your card. Yes. Yeah. So my, thank you, thank you. My question for you, as an entrepreneur or going through the journey. Yes, ma'am. What was your pivotal or aha moment? I'm on the right track. Keep pushing. Don't give up. Mm. <laughs> breakthrough. I'm stumped. Um, thank you. Um, and I'm so glad to meet you uh, because I am always looking for black wine owners, company owners around the country. Yeah, because it's like for our events like this, that's important. Um, wow. Well, let me say this. 
I have no regrets in life, but I ran for Congress in New York in 2008 and 2010, and clearly I lost, because I'm sitting here right now, <laughs> which I'm really glad to be sitting here right now. But before I ran, I was actually in Indiana, and I asked a, a, a white sister, elder white sister who brought me to speak at a college in Indiana, I said, do you think I should run for Congress? And the reason why I had decided to do it, because I had done a, number, a, a lot of Hurricane Katrina relief work in 05, 06. I was very impacted by what happened in Katrina, just going down to the Gulf back and forth. You know, she said to me, you're already doing what you're supposed to be doing. You know, she's like, you write, you speak, you help people, you're doing the consulting work, you know, you're getting to travel freely around the country, you're getting to travel outside the country. Why are you running for office? I couldn't really answer the question. I was like, well, I just want to serve people. And I don't regret it, because I do think we need people, especially younger people, to run for office. You know, we need as many of us to get involved in politics who really want, who are passionate about it. Um, but after I lost the second time, I said, aha, uh -huh. that woman in Indiana, that white sister was actually right. You were already doing what you're supposed to be doing, Kevin. You know what I mean? You don't need to do this path. This doesn't have to be your lane over here. And so it's like Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true. Now, does that mean I'll never run for office again? I don't think so, especially if my wife doesn't give me permission. Absolutely not. And she already said, nah, son, I ain't with that. You know what I'm saying? But um, I just think, follow your passion. That's what I would say. And unfortunately, there's been a few times in my life since five where I ignored my passion and went somewhere else, and it always came back to haunt me. So whatever your passions are, I would say stick with that, you know, and be the best at that. It doesn't mean you can't add on things. It doesn't mean it can't be more than one passion. But, you know, be excellent at a few things. You don't need to be excellent at a whole bunch of stuff. You know, I have a fraternity brother. Uh, I'm an alpha uh, who, um, who has, he could, he could do all kinds of stuff. And at a certain point, he said, you know what? I realized I was a jack or Jill of many trades, but not a master of any trade. You know what I mean? And so after the second congressional run, I said, Kev, here's your aha moment. Focus on the things that you really, really are exceptional at, and let's go for, let's go for that. You know what I mean? And that's what I've been doing. Yeah. Well, that's really good advice. I really appreciate everyone for coming out and listening tonight. Hopefully, you are taking something away about how to, you know, be your authentic self in places, how to stand up even when you're the only one and it's difficult. Um, you know, be, go out there and be great wherever you are. Um, thank you so much. Thank you.